God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in thy sight. You alone, Lord, are our strength and our redeemer. So once and again, Lord, we ask that you would take hold of our stammering tongue, put strength in our floundering frame, and allow me to be a mouthpiece for you, Lord, that your healing and redeeming and transforming word would go forth, never ever to come back void, but accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. Kill sin, Lord, where it's hiding in the marrow and the bone. Pour in strength where we are weak. Disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, God, we pray that you feed us till we want no more. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we do pray, and God, we give you thanks. Let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. amen. Come on, just give God a hand praise just because God deserves it. Just give him some praise because God deserves it. God is good. God is good. God is good. And all the time, God is worthy. And go on, do a little bit of it. Go on, do a little bit of it. Yeah. God is worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, God is worthy to be praised. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the, um, the band over here, um, the, uh, the fellas, guys. I thank you all for each week coming consistently. They come uh, correct. Um, and these singers have been so good this morning. They've been on point. And I don't know where you got that version of God has smiled on me, but keep it close at hand. I, I like that. I like that. I noticed... Um, some young people working with our um, junior deacon uh, ministry. We, I want all the junior deacons to stand up. Come on, stand up, turn around, let folks look at you. Give them, a, give them a good looking over. Don't they look good? Give me your baby. Give them a good looking over. Train up a child in the way that they should go. Gotta let them know there's much love for them in their church family. Much love for them. And, uh, and just so that you don't get confused, young ladies are as well eligible to be junior deacons. So those of you out there want to entrust our deacon ministry to be an extension of what you're trying to pour into them, then uh, tell them you want them to be a, a, a junior, junior deacon. And um, you ought to do like my mama did. She's sitting right there. I got voluntold. I was not asked to be in the junior choir. I was told. I was not asked to be on the usher board. I was told. I was not asked to go to Sunday school. I was told. I think I was 30 years old before somebody asked me anything. And, I was told you will thank me later. How many of you were raised by that kind of grace? You will thank me later. We need to get back to that. Stop asking your children what they want to do. You the adult. Tell them what they need to do. Amen. And tell them that it's cold and hungry on the other side of that door. <laughs> that ain't child abuse. That's good parenting. Amen. 
Stand with me and turn with me to a passage that I always treat at least once during this Easter tide. Easter tide is the season between Resurrection Sunday and Pentecost Sunday, the um, 40 days in which Jesus provided infallible proofs that he had been raised in days before cell phones, cameras, and street cameras, and all those other tangible evidence, the only evidence that he was raised is that he made sure that enough people saw him, that they could not deny that truth, that he was risen from the dead. So a passage I treat every year from a different angle, I want to read again today. So I want to begin reading the first verse in the 21st chapter. I'm reading from the King James Version. After these things, Jesus showed himself again uh, to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. On this wise, he showed himself. They were together, Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus and Nathanael of Canaan in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, We also going with you. They went forth and entered the ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. When the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you will find. They cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea, and the other disciples came in a little ship. for They were not far from land, but as it were, two hundred cubits driving, dragging the net of fishes, and soon they, as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus said to them, bring of the fishes which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty-three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus said to them, come and dine. None of the disciples did ask, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took bread and gave them and fish likewise. And this is how now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said, Feed my lambs. He said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love you. And Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, Thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spoke he, signifying by what death Peter should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, See if the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? And Jesus said unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? Follow me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciple should not die. Jesus said, not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there were also many other things which Jesus did, 
which if they were written every one, I suppose that not even the world itself could contain the books that should be written. Amen. The 21st chapter of the gospel is recorded by St. John. You may be seated in the presence of God and each other. Sometimes you got to keep the text in the context and it's hard to chop up a narrative. Um, I want to use as a subject this morning in this first uh, second week of Easter tide, second uh, after resurrection morning itself, a subject of what Jesus owed Peter. What Jesus owed Peter. Ask your neighbor right now, do you know what Jesus owed Peter? And if they look like they don't know what you're talking about, tell them you ought to pay attention. I laugh at people who say the Bible don't contradict itself, and I say to them like I say to Trump, turn that Bible upside right and read it. <laughs> Contradicts itself all the time, and you see you no know, better play, no more compelling place you see those contradictions than in the various resurrection narratives. Some say that only Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and uh, bumped into Jesus, thought it was a gardener, and then others say that uh, Mary and the, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. And then one says that uh, it was Mary Magdalene and a band of women, in, including um, uh, 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 Cusa's wife, and um, then there's another one that said it was a band of women and Salma. Then one account says that an angel was sitting on the tomb where the stone had been rolled away and say, hey, here, he's risen, as he said. Then another says that there was two men on opposite sides of the tomb and said, come on in, let me show you where his body was. He is risen, as he said. Why well, seek he the living among the dead? Then another says that they went in the tomb and then they saw the two people sitting there, one at the top and one at the bottom. Ain't no way you're going to reconcile it. Each one of them told these stories differently and arranged the details to make a theological point. One, none of them lying. Each one of them was attaching the details in ways that made the theological point, the truth. They're, they're allowing you to see through a keyhole of truth. And they took prerogative to shift and change details because the factual exactness was not necessarily the same as truth. I've got a word, there's a difference between facts and truth. Fact, I got sickness in my body. Truth is well with my soul. Facts, I got bills due, don't know where the money's coming from. Truth, the Lord will make a way. Fact. I'm a sinner. Truth, I'm saved despite my sin because he's been better to me than I've been to myself. There's a difference between facts and truth. And Jesus didn't say, I am the way, the fact, and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can stack the facts and, and not tell the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And so the writers give conflicting accounts in terms of the details, and you have to follow each story to say, what is this writer trying to tell me about the truths of God and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And one of the most compelling accounts is what we find here in John, who describes himself in his own estimation as being the disciple that Jesus loved. The inference is the one that he loved the most. And uh, in my opinion, if I'm writing the story, I would probably be the one that... Uh, <laughs> That's the power of the pen. And, and the story tells us that uh, Jesus has uh, appeared to his disciples several times, and this is the third instance that he has appeared to the disciples. And it tells us at the beginning of the 21st chapter that Jeez, that Peter has gone fishing. It's his go-to because Peter, like Humpty Dumpty, has had a great fall. If you recall the events of earlier chapters, before the crucifixion, he, at the Last Supper, when Jesus conveys to them that one of you is about to betray me, 
Peter blurts out being so susceptible to setting his mouth in motion before he sets his mind in gear. And he makes a big boast. Not me, Lord. I'm ready to go with you both into prison and unto death. Peter was a man's man. He was a high testosterone type of brother. There was James and John, sons of Zebedee, and they looked up to Peter, the cussing, cutting fisherman called to be a fisher of men. And, and, and he had made a big boast at the Lord's Supper. Lord, I don't, the rest of these guys may get weak. The rest of these guys may be soft, but I'm ready to go with you both into prison and unto death. And it was to Peter that the Lord had said in the 16th chapter of Matthew, as Matthew records it, he says, blessed art thou, Peter. His name on his birth certificate was Simon. That was his birth name. Peter was his religious title that Jesus had given him. And Peter meant Petrus, which meant rock. It was an indication of the role that Peter was to play in this new ecclesia, in this new covenant community, this new community of faith uh, called what would eventually be called church, the new covenant community through the blood of Jesus Christ. He was to be the rock. He was to be the head of the mother church in Jerusalem. And Hebrew people were very intentional about names. Names were not a crown that I put on your head as a suggestion of achievement, but names were a crown that I put above your head for you to struggle and aspire to grow up to and to live up to. That rock designation was not an indication of where he already was, but what he could be and what he needed to grow into being in Jesus' expectation of the impact that he would have within the broader life of the church. I need you to be stable as a rock. Peter gets out over his skis and says, I don't care what anybody else does, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both in the prison and unto death. And the Lord, knowing Peter better than he knew himself, said, Peter, 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 I got great things for you as indicated by the name that I'm giving you, but I also know you. What you're going to be and what you are is two different things. There's a gap and we're in the in-between time. And he said that the cock will not crow three times. And before three days have passed, you're going to deny me not once, not twice, but three times. And he did. The final time he cursed out the little servant girl in the courtyard who thought she recognized him. I think I've seen you on Facebook with Jesus. <laughs> and he cussed her out real good. White folk curse, black folk cuss. She cussed him out real good. I told you I don't know him. And instead of being like a rock and steady like a rock, he acted more like shifting sand. And after his big boast, he was like Humpty Dumpty. And now, here you have a few days after the resurrection and Jesus, their Lord, is dead. And all the high expectation that now the Lord will restore Israel to the monarchy like it was a thousand years earlier with David and Solomon, that he would throw off the yoke of the oppression, the oppression of the Romans, that didn't happen. The Lord has been murdered and the people who murdered him are now looking for them like a deck of cards. So now they're fearing for themselves. John tells us they're cringing in places. Jesus got to walk through locked doors as they are fortified, trying to keep, put barriers between them and this, this, this January 6th type motley mob that's looking for the followers of Jesus Christ. And, 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 that, and he also has to deal with the shame of having made such a big boast and fallen before the other men. He has collapsed. There's guilt, there's shame, there's fear. There's a toxic psychological cocktail in his mind. There is a tempest in his mind. And everybody I know, self-included, when it all collapses down, we all have a go-to. For some people, it's a bowl of chocolates. For some people, it's the casino that you go to because they got good food, right? For some people, it's shopping to go get some clothes that you have no idea how you're going to pay it off after you put down your plastic. Huh? For some people, it's Jack Daniels or Bark Hardy or whoever them fellas are in the stage store <laughs> that help you take the edge off of. We all have a go-to. Some are constructive, some are not so constructive. Peter's go-to when he couldn't do anything else, he grew up fishing. I'm going fishing. 
he goes fishing because he's embarrassed, he's shamed, he's a fear, fearful, he's guilt-ridden, and the others go fishing just because Peter's going fishing. Even when Peter's at his worst, he's still a leader. He still has a magnetic presence. And there they are fishing, and they hear a voice from a stranger on the shore that calls out and says, Sirs, have you any meat? And they reluctantly say, we have fished all night and we have caught nothing. This isn't the first time they have come up with nothing. You're not, there's no guarantee that the fish are going to be biting. But on top of everything else that has happened, there's a particular field of futility here. It seems when it rains, it pours. Now I can't even do what I've always done and had some competence in. When I feel most helpless, most unworthy, Ah, now it seems that now there's a futility even in what I've always had some measure of, 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 of competence in. And the stranger from the shore that they don't recognize is Jesus. We see throughout the Gospels that uh, Jesus in his resurrection body uh, is not necessarily seen with these eyes. They recognize him through spiritual insight, but not through necessarily 2020 calculations, not through optic uh, verifications. And, and he says, cast the net on the right side of the boat, not opposite of left, but on the right side of the boat, which in itself was not an unusual command because schools of fish sometimes swim in long and rectangular columns. You literally can fish on one side of the boat and not catch anything, and there'd be thousands of fish in a long rectangular column on the other side of the boat. And so this wasn't an extraordinary uh, uh, suggestion. They cast the net on the other side of the boat, and now all of a sudden they have more fishes than they can uh, even contain and hold. They was, the text says later on it was 153 fish. We don't know what that designation is about, but they've literally gone from futility to overflow. And the difference between the two, and here's one of the points that John is trying to make, if, if, if your life seems out of sorts, if it seems that nothing is going right, the difference between a, a life of futility where you're jumping up and down and landing in the same place, where you're making a lot of tracks and not getting anywhere, where it seems like you're spitting in the wind and you, and you feel so useless that it seems like even the things that used to go right ain't going right no more, the difference between futility and the overflow is following the obedient, being obedient obedient to the command of the voice of the Lord from the shore. There's, there, there's an invocation here there of a memory of what happened in the second chapter of the Gospel of John. This is deja vu when Jesus performed his first public miracle, when the wine ran out at the marriage feast, which was a crisis because the wine and its abundance represented how many children the couple would have, have. And it was a bad omen. If the wine ran out, it suggested that they might be barren. And so Jesus' mama comes and says, the wine has run out. Jesus said, that's not my business. And Jesus' mama felt that there were some prerogatives that came with being mama. Anybody got a mama that feels like, boy, I done birthed you, I done put up with you, I done fed you? There's some prerogatives that come with being mama. And then she turned and said, whatever Jesus says, you do it. And Jesus took a deep breath Looked at his mama with jaundiced eye, but then he did exactly what his mama said, and he told him, fill them pots with water and take them to the host. And sometime between the time they filled the pots with flat water when they got to the host, and he tasted it, and it was the best form of, of Zinfandel. It was, it was the best form of Zinfandel. Come on, somebody. You know what brands are out there. And the difference between the flat water that they put in and the wine, the good wine, that, that, it, that it had transformed into is they were obedient to what the Lord said. And I come to tell somebody this morning, and maybe this is all that God meant for you from this message, is that the difference between the futility that you feel and the overflow that you desire is to learn to be obedient to whatever the Lord says, you do it. It turns flat water to wine and it turns off fishing all night and coming up with nothing and all of a sudden more than what you can handle because they've been obedient to the voice of the one who calls from the shore. They get to the shore and that's all the prelude. That's all the run up. And then after they sat down and have breakfast on the shore, then as the others go on, Jesus now calls Peter into the private precincts. 
of a solitary conversation. And he asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? And he asked him three times. It was a ritual of restoration and forgiveness. Because three times Jesus, Peter denied him three times. He gives him the opportunity to say, Lord, I, I love you. Peter says to the Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus has circled back to forgive and restore Peter. We always talk about what Peter owed Jesus, what we owe the Lord. Um, but this text is about what Jesus owed Peter. Jesus owed Peter forgiveness. Sit with that. How can the Lord be in debt? Jesus owed Peter forgiveness. Peter was minding his own business when Jesus came along. And the scripture says in the first John that he called Andrew, his brother, who and another disciple, they were, they were disciples of John, Jesus' cousin. And then when Jesus was baptized at the Jordan by John, John said when he saw Jesus, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And it said that Andrew and the other disciples stopped following John and then started following Jesus. And then it says then that Andrew was Simon Peter's brother. And then Peter went home or Simon or Andrew went home and got his brother Peter. And that's how Peter became a follower of Jesus Christ because his brother got saved first. And I wonder who in your family is going to come to know Jesus because you got to know Jesus first. And you go home and tell somebody about what the Lord has done for you. Peter literally becomes a disciple of Jesus off the testimony of his brother. And, um, and Jesus says to them, come and follow me. And they drop their nets. He says, I'll make you fishes of men and not fishes of fish. Peter did not choose Jesus. Jesus chose Peter. Why is that important? Because in Jewish teaching, just like in Greek culture, the students selected their teacher. The student selected their teacher. Plato selected Aristotle as his teacher. The student selected the teacher and requested that they would teach them. Jesus told them in the dawning of their ministry, don't get it twisted. I've inverted the value system. You have not chose me. I have chosen you. I interrupted, intervened, I disrupted, dislocated, dislodged you from your formal, your former aspirations and engagements. And I told you to come follow me. And now that you have told me to come follow you and have heaped upon me all of these heavy expectations, the question is, now that I have fallen and been less than my best, are you suffering buyer's remorse? Or is the good news of Jesus Christ, is it only good news when we're good? Or is there grace in this thing that those whom God calls, what of it? What is the good news when we have fallen? And Jesus owes Peter forgiveness. Hey, the text that you read earlier from John where it said, uh, do not sin. He calls us that we do not. I've said these things to you that you do not sin. It says, but then if you do sin, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. If you say you have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in. It says almost laughable. It really isn't a backhanded attempt at humor. It says that, you know, I say these things to you that you do not sin, but then if you do sin, as if there's an if. <laughs> Anybody who's ever raised kids, we tell our kids what they should not do, but you better have a backup plan. <laughs> have I got a witness? And that in the Lord's prayer, he told him, Lord, this is the way I want you to pray. He said, pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but don't stop there. Put a comma out of period. He says, but then I'll keep praying, but deliver us from evil. <laughs> Lord, don't, don't lead us into a tempting place, but when we get there anyway... Come get me, Lord. Have I got a witness? 
Your mama tell you don't go down there with them people. And then when you go down there, the people get in trouble. You got to call mama. Mama, come get me from where you told me not to go because I went there anyway. And so now that, that, that Peter, who was minding his own business, and the Lord called him, the Lord comes back, and he owes Peter forgiveness. He owes Peter forgiveness because if Jesus does not forgive Peter, then, then the others will not forgive Peter. And he'll never be the leader among the others if, the, if they believe that God is through with Peter. And if the Lord does not forgive and restore Peter, then Peter's not going to be there in the third, second chapter of the book of Acts when 50 days after the Passover, when the power of the Holy Ghost comes down and, and invests itself in the church and the, and the power of the Spirit comes down and then spreads out and lands on them like cloven tongues of fire and everyone hears the gospel in his own language and 3,000 souls, the church was a mega church on the very first day because Peter stood up and said, let me tell you, ain't nobody up in here drunk, not of no wine but maybe off the Holy Spirit. He said, this is what the prophet Joel meant four and a half centuries earlier when he said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. Sons and your daughters shall prophesy. If he doesn't restore, Peter ain't going to be no interpreter of that moment. He owes Peter forgiveness. If he, doesn't, if he does not forgive Peter, Peter's not going to be there in, in the eighth chapter when when. When the Samaritans, the mixed race that Jewish people despised because they thought that they were unclean, when they heard the gospel and were baptized and they dispatched him and James to go down there and see if them nasty people could be, could be uh, uh, saved like they were. And Peter went down and went back and reported to him. He said that the Holy Ghost fell on them just like it did in the upper room. If Jesus doesn't forgive Peter, then that means when Cornelius the centurion sends his men uh, down to Joppa to get him after he's had a dream about food which wasn't about food it was about folk and sends for him to come and him and his whole house is waiting to hear the gospel and Peter's not going to be there to tell him that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but would have everlasting life and it says and while he was preaching the Holy Ghost fell on them and he began to baptize the, the Gentiles he's not there to preach and the spirit fall if Jesus doesn't restore Peter Jesus owes Peter, forgiveness. Because none of us can be perfect. Have I got a witness? And if Jesus doesn't forgive Peter, then the others won't forgive Peter and the church will never come together. You know, history, black history, recent history is a story about the fact that uh, in the campaign of Shirley Chisholm, the congressperson that arrived from Harlem, uh, who was running for president in 1972, um, when Democrats were obsessed with trying to make sure Nixon didn't get a second term, they didn't want Tricky Dick to get a second term. Although Tricky Dick was a boy scout, uh, he was a boy scout compared to Donald Trump. We need to dig, you know, Nixon up and apologize to him. Because <laughs> what he did now looks quite pedestrian compared to what this neo-fascist racist gangster has done and is doing. But that's a whole nother sermon. I wish I had a witness up in here. <laughs> and, 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 and Shirley Chisholm, when they got to the California primary, and, and George McGovern was trying to get the black delegates to, to all get behind him so that he could win nomination on the first ballot. And Shirley Chisholm was telling them to hold out so they could exact some uh, demands and affect the Democratic platform. She was saying, hold on to your vote. And the U.S. representative from Berkeley, Robert Dellums, or Ron Dellums, and uh, he went behind her back. He promised her support, but then went behind her back and told all of the black delegates to get behind McGovern and basically undermine putting forth a black candidate, he basically brought an end to the viability of her candidacy. Was it a backstab move? Yes. And young activists like Barbara Lee, who is now one of the iconic elders, but was a young college student there and brokenhearted and didn't plan to ever forgive uh, 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 Dellums at the time. And Shirley Chisholm said, no, 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 I want to reach out to him 
And they, and they said, you don't owe him nothing. And she said, no, I owe him forgiveness. I owe him forgiveness because he's just doing what he thinks is best. Did he lie to me? Yes. Does it hurt? Yes. But if I don't forgive him, we'll stay divided and we'll be even worse. And my brothers and my sisters, not only did Jesus owe Peter forgiveness, but all of us need to sit here right now and ask ourselves the question, who do we owe forgiveness that we've been withholding? Are you patty caking? That's a very real question. Who do we owe forgiveness to? And without the withholding of it, where's the family fractured because we keep holding, we're dug into our position? Where's the church, the, the works of the church gummed up because you refuse to give somebody your forgiveness because yes, they lied, yes, they injured you, yes, they hurt you. But what about all that? Bless those who curse you, pray for those who hate you, do good to those who despitefully use. Jesus has been teaching all along about how to, how to get beyond the breach, how to restore it. How do you, after we fall out, how do we fall back in? Because the forgiveness that you, that you withhold is a clog in the drain. Uh, one of the things I've had to face about myself, I'm a fighter, I'm a battler. And most people who are battlers are better at declaring war than peace. But I've learned that you move people forward more by forgiveness than by launching another attack. Jesus owes Peter forgiveness because if Jesus don't forgive Peter, then Peter can't be the rock that he wants him to be. Have I got a witness? Um, but that's not all Jesus owes Peter. Is he, through this act of forgiveness and restoration, to let him know that, that failure does not mean the cancellation of your call. Okay? Failure does not mean the cancellation of your call. We live in a cancel culture. Well, some people believe that one misstep, one false step, one mishap, one ugly disclosure, and in their mind, you have no good ever again. You, you are no better than your worst day. But I heard someone, Beverly, tell me a long time ago, you're not as good as your best day, and you're not as bad as your worst day. And most of us in here with our heads held halfway high have I got a witness because someone looked beyond our faults and saw our needs and despite how we fell down, we allowed the grace to get back up again. We fall down and we get up. Saints are just sinners who fall down and get back up. Have I got two, three witnesses up in here? That failure does not mean the cancellation of your call. The kingdom of God does not ride on the wheels of a cancel culture, but a restoration culture. And, but not only does Jesus offer the old Peter forgiveness, he also owes him unvarnished truth about what the call is going to demand from him. In the private precincts of that solitary conversation, he says to him, after he has restored to him, he tells him something about the awful grace of God. He says to him, he said, there will come a time when, he says, right now you dress yourself, you go where you want to go, but there's going to come a time when you will stretch forth your hands and you're going to be under arrest. And they're going to drag you where you don't want to go. And then John explains, he gives simultaneous narration and interpretation. He said he told them this, speaking in metaphor about by what death he would glorify God. Jesus had said to the disciples early in his teaching with them, he said, if any man will come after me, you choose. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And he was not speaking in hyperbole. He was not speaking in abstraction. He knew that the specter of the cross had risen early in his life and that he had a date with the Roman cross, but that they as his followers, as witnesses of him, all of the disciples, the record shows, except John, the baby boy, 
who explains here that God allowed him to stay alive so he could record these things. Uh, but all of the others died a martyr's death. That, in fact, is the meaning of the word witness. To be a martyr is to be a witness. You witness with the pouring out of your life like a libation for a cause. Jesus had told them, he said, you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. We literally, as Christians, we come through a long line of martyrs and monks and missionaries who braved the God-awful, unbeaten paths of life that led to perilous ends. He asked the disciples when James and John asked for the seat of the right hand and the left hand of him, thinking that they were going to get a gainful political perch. And he asked them, can you drink from the cup that I drink from? And they flippantly, they made a big boast and said, yes, we can. And didn't realize what they were really signing on to. Like a young kid in the neighborhood talking about, I ain't no snitch, I ain't no snitch. But when you get them in that investigation room and they shine that bright late light and you don't know which one of them cops is punching you and tell you the difference between a suspended sentence or uh, eight to 10 in a cell with Bubba who ain't seen a woman in 20 years. And you're the closest to Beyonce, he gonna come. <laughs> Unless you tell me something I can use. They sing like a canary. Have I got it? it would sound like DeBarge back in the day. People make the boast, but when the bill comes due, Jesus says to Peter, there's going to come a day where you will follow me. And he did. And to honor his Lord, when it came time for him, when he got to that proud old city of Rome, he said, turn my cross upside down because I'm not, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. So turn it upside down so I don't think that I am as he just because I'm crucified like he. Jesus here, when Peter hears that, 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 that crucifixion, that mortal danger is not a possibility, not even a probability, it is an inevitability. He hears it like you and me. For truly, there is a truth that misery loves company. If I'm going to get my behind whoop, seem like somebody else ought to get one too. Have you ever grown up told on your brothers and your sisters just because you knew that you was on your way to that licking stick? Ain't no sense in holding on to this information now. <laughs> misery loves company because it looked like mama got enough whooping in there for Norman, Felicia, April, and Heather so let's just make this a family thing <laughs> and he says well, what about this man and the gentle savior who just restored him because he owed him forgiveness turns just that quickly and rebukes him and he essentially says to him in shorthand mind your business because not only does he have a grace, unmerited favor, inexhaustible resources of grace, he also is a sovereign Lord, that in God's sovereignty, God does what God wants to do, and God owes us no explanation. He said, if it is my desire that he remains alive till the clouds roll back and Roman and that, and that Gabriel blasts his trumpet and I descend for my return, that's my business. What I do in his life, how I use him has nothing to do with you. I am not obligated toward you because of how I bless him. The old hymn says that I don't know about the future says, but if my path, the, if the path that be my fortune lead through fame of flood, I am covered. I am blessed with his presence. I am covered with his blood. My path may go through fame and go, go through flood. Your path may seem like a bed of ease compared to mine. God is free, always free to do differently in your life, to do in my life, and not even to explain it to me. And my job is to walk by faith and to trust. God has a plan, even if his plan includes nails in my hands while you sit there on a bed of ease. And he says, if that's my will for him, then that's my business between me and him. But I need you to have with bright eyes sobriety to understand, Peter, you need to know the call that I have on your life. When John Kennedy was smitten by an assassin's bullet in Dallas in 19, November 1963, that following summer at the Democratic Convention, when his brother Robert Kennedy, that they knew was so a symbiotic tie between those two Kennedy brothers, 
when he stood for the first time publicly at that Democratic convention, there was a 20-minute ovation before the crowd would calm down and allow him to speak. And it was in honor of his, the, 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 the now late dead president. And with, with wistful, wet eyes, the first words out of his mouth, he quoted one of my favorite Greek philosophers, Ancales, when he said, pain that cannot forget falls drop by drop onto the ground until in our despair, by the awful grace of God, cometh wisdom. The awful grace of God. We tend to think of the grace of God as something delightful and sentimental. But the truth is most of the truths that we've learned in life are hard truths that we learn through hard times. Now, most of the strength we've gained, we gain from climbing the rough side of the mountains. And even the sweetness that most of us have gained in life is because we have, we, we've been cast down, but we weren't destroyed. We were troubled on every side, but not in despair. We were perplexed, and, 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 but not in despair. Through the hard times, we've gotten bigger and stronger. Somebody once said, if I'd never had a problem, I would never know and learn how to solve them. That's the awful grace of God. Sometimes God puts us through hell to, to, to allow a little foretaste of heaven to show up in our character. The awful, the awful, the awful grace of God. I was, I was looking the other day, and uh, I watched again that, that wonderful uh, movie, 1989 movie, Glory. It's one of my favorite movies after Django Unchained. That's my favorite of all times. It just blesses my heart every time I watch that movie. If you haven't watched it, go home and watch it and let the Lord bless you real good. <laughs> And, 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 and it's the story uh, about the 54th Volunteer Negro Regiment of Soldiers from Massachusetts that was, that was led by Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, who got injured in the Battle of Antietam. And his influential father had him appointed over one of the few Negro volunteer regiments that were used primarily as manual labor, which meant another form of slavery. But they wouldn't let him fight. But they needed to breach the walls of Fort Wagner. And the problem was you could only access Fort Wagner by a narrow strip of beachfront that made you where you were completely vulnerable to Confederate soldiers who were inside the fort shooting down their cannonball fire and, and shooting down their rifles. And, and, and it, was, it was like shooting into a fish tank. And uh, when they, they asked for, it was such a suicide mission. That's really what it was. When they asked for, for what, 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 what company of soldiers wanted to try and breach the walls of Fort Wagner, while well, all the white boys who threw their mockery at those black soldiers earlier stood there. Robert Gould Shaw, an injured white man, would cast his lot among the despised. Speaking on behalf of, his own, of all those men, half of them runaway slaves who bore in their body the marks of a nation that was born on a principle of freedom that they did not apply to the, their children uh, who were burnt black by the equatorial sun. And, and, and he, he asked for the honor of attempting to breach the wall of Fort Wagner. And as it would go, Fort Wagner was never conquered. And almost all who fought from the 54th Regiment of Colored Soldiers, almost all died, and those who died fared better than those who were captured alive because they were tortured and then killed. But the news of their valor reached President Lincoln, who then by executive order opened up, sent the call across the nation for more blacks to join the Union Army. And 100, 180,000 responded to the call and then put them into the fight because when you took a black man and gave him a rifle and permission to shoot white men, you didn't have to ask them twice. And that provided the difference in the balance of the war. Their valor reached Lincoln and legitimized in his mind that these men are soldiers. These men who pulled the plow, these men who had to run on the Underground Railroad trust, trying to stay a step ahead of the bloodhounds braying on their trail, that these men are soldiers. And they called the movie Glory. It says here that uh, 
Jesus told Peter by what death he would glorify the Lord. Think about that, uh, uh, Kendrick. By what death he would glorify the Lord, that God would be glorified in, 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 in his death. Glorified, the awful grace of God, that through his death, through his suffering, through his persecution, God would be glorified. That's what Jesus said when Lazarus came forth from the tomb. This sickness is not unto death, but that the Lord might be glorified. Don't we understand sometimes the hell and the heartache that we go through? God is glorified by how we go through our willingness to go through and that we trust them enough to get through. Don't you understand to be a disciple of the one who would take the nails for us? That conviction costs in this world of entitlement where people think their feelings are the ultimate measure of right or wrong. There once was a time when we told people, that world out there don't owe you nothing. Don't nobody care about the way you feel. Suck it up. Get over it. That ain't abuse. That's real. Come on, somebody. We've got to have, brothers and sisters, Jesus, you've got to have a, 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 a Belgian waffle testimony. A Belgian waffle. What you talking about, preacher? I'm so glad you asked. A Belgian, well, Belgian waffle. You know what the difference between a? I was, I, I was talking to an egg. I had a conversation with an egg, and the egg was talking to me because I wanted a Belgian waffle, the one that was big and fluffy and not the regular waffle. And 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 then the egg started talking to me. He said, Pastor Braxton, listen to me. This is too real good. The difference between a regular waffle that's flat and a Belgian waffle that billows is you got to beat me. I said, What are you talking about? He said, The difference is, first of all, you got to rip me apart. You got to separate the yolk from the white, put the yolk in one bowl with the other ingredients, put the white over in another bowl. I said, okay, I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you, but I ain't done yet. Then after you put the whites over in another bowl, you got to get a beater and you got to beat it because the more, why I got to beat it? Because the more you beat it, the fluffier it gets. Ah, come on somebody. You got to beat it till it gets fluffy. You got to beat it till it gets white. You got to beat it till it gets cloud-like. And then you take those beaten eggs that through the beating, the more you beat it, the lighter and the fluffier it gets. Then you fold it into to the batter and now when you cook it on the grill instead of it being flat it's gonna grow what did Jesus say I need you to be the leaven that raises the whole lump the leaven that raises the whole lump is the element that was beaten that went through them come on somebody who no people in this country has pushed America more toward democracy than those who have come over a way that with tears has been watered and tread of blood path through the blood of the sun but the more they beat us the sweeter we got the more they beat us we just said this is my story this is my song I'm praising my savior all the day long come on somebody the more you beat me Jesus said if you drive the nails in my hands if you put the spikes in my feet if you put a crown of thorns on my brow if you bury me on Friday hey 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 I'm getting up on Sunday morning Jesus wants people and Peter to know that in the mathematics of God. Sometimes you got to subtract before you can add. Sometimes you got to go down before you get raised up. You, you can't experience resurrection until you go through crucifixion. Have I got a witness? Hey, hey, hey. Can't stop this world from knocking me down. Can't stop this world from lying on my name. Can't stop this world from laying me in the grave but the world can't stop God from raising me up again the world can't stop God from healing my wounds the world can't stop God from making me sweeter after the suffering the world can't stop God the world can't stop God from giving us life after death go ahead mock my name go ahead bury me go ahead Seal me in the grave Cause when God gets ready I said when God gets ready Ain't no stone he can't roll away Have I get a witness? And whether it's one angel Two angels One woman Three women All I know They all came to the same conclusion He lives Yes he does He lives Yeah He lives He lives He lives yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah! 
Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Oh, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no Oh, Jesus. There's a church all over. Oh, Jesus. Here yeah, for the world today. today. Above him there's no other. Oh, Jesus is the way. Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Yes, he is. Above him there's no other. I know, I know. In case you have some questions in the corners of your mind, traces of discouragement, peace you cannot find. In case you did not know that the word of God is true, everything he promised, oh, he will do for you. I know, I know, Jesus is. Whosoever will, would you come? If you're without a church home, if you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus, I invite you to come. Tomorrow's not promised. Tomorrow's not promised. If you're out there in the digisphere, hit that button that says, how do I become a member? Let today be the first day of the rest of your life. Whosoever will, whosoever will, whosoever will. Can I say that again? Well, in case you have a few questions, where? in the corners of your mind traces of discouragement peace you cannot find and oh in case you did not know that the word of God it's all true everything he promised Lord he will do for you oh Jesus Jesus is the way, oh, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, yeah. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, I know, I know. Listen, 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 listen. I don't know what you're waiting on because some people just go from place to place to place. Everything God does, God does by covenant. By covenant. And the covenant does not require us to be perfect because once we enter into covenant with Christ, then the Lord does the perfecting. We're never all of what the Lord wants us to be or aspires us to be. It's a crown over our head that we're trying to grow up to. And every day we get a little bit better. Sometimes we fall back. But God does not have buyer's remorse. God owes you forgiveness and God's willing to forgive you. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive it and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I'm so glad today that the Lord doesn't require us to be sinless or act like we are. But just be honest. Touch your neighbor and say, if you can just be honest, you can get past this. Come on. Touch your neighbor and say, if you can just be honest, you can get past this. I don't know what that means in your life, but if you can just be honest, don't lie to yourself, don't lie to God, and don't lie to others. If you can just be honest, truth will set you free. So if you're here today and you need a church home, if you need a church home, I invite you to come. Touch your neighbor and say, stop lying, stop lying. Today's the day for truth. Stop lying, stop lying to yourself because you don't even believe it. Stop lying to your neighbor. They don't believe it. If you can be honest with yourself, God got more grace than you got mess. There's no sin his blood cannot cover. There's no hurt his grace cannot heal. And there's no dark corner your life can roll into that God's light cannot find you. So if you're here today and you need a church home, if you've never been baptized in his name, come on, if you're out there in the digisphere, hit that button. If you hit that
red button. And if you're in the house, why don't you come on down this aisle and extend to us the hand of fellowship. Whosoever will. Whosoever will. I know, I know that Jesus, Mary's little baby, oh, above him. God bless you, sister. There's others. Will you come? I know, I know that Jesus, for the whole wide world, above him there's no other. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the Mary's answer. little baby. For the world today. Him, there's no For the other. There's no other. Oh, Jesus. Jesus is the way. Say it again, Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Yes, he is. For the world today. Yes, he is. For the world there's no other. Yes, he is. Jesus is the I know, way. I know that my Jesus. Jesus Somebody bless the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody bless the name of Jesus. I ain't finished. I'm just going to stop. <laughs>